choice but to commit those crimes because they were in a, a life and death struggle. But do you agree that crimes such as uh, murder, bombings, and cover-ups um, are very, very serious crimes indeed. In fact, you, you probably couldn't get more serious crimes than, than those. I don't agree with that, and I will never agree with that, uh, my Lord. I wasn't aware at that stage of such actions that were done by the security branch where I was attached to the security branch. Well, if you weren't aware at the time, I, I presume that you are aware now that the most senior officers in the security branch in applications before the amnesty committee, and several of those applications were granted, they received amnesty for these crimes. Um, they carried out um, a program of criminality and given that we're talking about murders, uh, bombings and cover-ups, um, uh, we, we, one could describe those kind of crimes as a reign of terror, do you not agree? I do agree, my lord. And one would even go so far as to say that given that these crimes were being carried out or alternatively authorized by the most senior officers of the security branch through the 1980s, that with the benefit of hindsight, the security branch was in effect a criminal organization. I, I won't agree to that, uh, my lord. Uh, I'm sure certain individuals in the security branch could be branded, but I won't, I won't accept that the whole security branch was operating as a criminal organization that time. Is someone perhaps on mute? There's some background noise, I don't know, is that Mr. Amity's chambers or...? Um, pardon? Uh, there, there was just some background noise, some background interference, it seems to have gone now. But sh surely, uh, Mr. Swanepoel, we're not talking about uh, junior officers engaging in private frolics. We're talking about the most senior officers engaging in the most serious crimes. Um, that, that presumably described the kind of organization that um, the security branch was. You can hardly say that officers at the, at the level of general and at the level of brigadier uh, were engaging in private frolics on their own. This was an organizational um, program of criminality. Really, uh, my lord, I, I, I can't believe that the whole security branch could be branded as a criminal organization because of certain individuals that uh, had their own way of doing things or were involved in criminal activities to that extent. Uh, I learned only later about that uh, when uh, people or when security officers apply for amnesty uh, for crimes they committed. But do, do you now today regret the fact that the security branch, which was part of the South African police and meant to protect and serve the people of South Africa, do you regret knowing today that they carried out extrajudicial killings and they carried out other crimes such as bombings. Do you regret the, the, that fact? I do, my lord. Now, in your evidence um, yesterday, you spoke about um, certain criteria that the security branch employed for purposes of recruiting people. And you, you mentioned that uh, recruits would need to have good qualities. Uh, you, you recall that? I do recall, my lord. 
would I be right in saying that one of the qualities that was a requirement for recruitment um, was loyalty to the National Party government? I agree, my lord. Yes. Now, while we're on the culture of the uh, security branch, um, I want to put a, a statement to you and you can indicate to me whether you think it's an accurate reflection or not. In the security culture of that time, there was no space for members to split or accuse other members of irregularities. Does that more or less re reflect the culture in the organization in the 1980s? Uh, uh, my Lord, at that stage, I, uh, to a certain extent, but uh, the, the method of uh, you need to know basis was applied during that stage in the security branch. You were only informed of activities that you need to know and wasn't informed of the whole operating system. Yes. Well, l l l l let me cut to the chase. Th this statement, in fact, is made by uh, Warrant um, Officer Nico Dietlifs, um, who was uh, with the security branch um, in the early 1980s and in fact was one of the interrogators on the 10th floor. Um, really what he's saying is that there's an expectation, perhaps an unwritten expectation, an unwritten rule that you don't split, you don't tell on your colleagues, your comrades in arms, if they've done something wrong, you don't rush to a superior you don't report him, you don't open up a case. That, that's what he's saying. Do, do you agree? I don't agree, my lord. In my case, I would definitely, if I, I were aware of, 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 of serious crimes committed by, by security branch people or, or any uh, criminal activities, I would report it. So that's what you would have done? But do you agree with Warrant Officer Dietlifs that, not speaking about you right now, but the general culture in the security branch amongst most officers generally is that they would not have opened up uh, a case or reported uh, a wrongdoing by one of their comrades in arms? I don't agree with Nico Dietlifs, uh, my lord. He says further, we had to stand together and cover each other in order to protect the security branch? Do you maybe that, that? Uh, my Lord, maybe that uh, applied to certain individuals in the security branch, but it wasn't the broad security branch as such that upheld that view. He also says, on many an occasion, Major Conrad made it clear that our work at the branch was in the interest of the country, that we should do everything in our ability to protect the country against communism and the ANC. Does that sound right? It sounds right, my lord. Um, and, and then, my lord, um, quoting another paragraph, uh, my lord, this is Mr. Dietrich's affidavit filed as K1 before this honorable court last year, paragraph 13. So, Mr. Dietlifs um, said the following, I am aware that my evidence before the inquest in 1982 was incorrect and not the truth, and that my affidavit that served before the investigation in 1982 did not contain the correct facts. He then goes on to explain that he felt a level of intimidation one of the reasons were that when he testified, there were always senior officers of the security branch present in court. Do you do not agree that uh, the attorneys would have felt intimidated? I don't agree, my lord. When I testified in the 1982 inquest, I talked the truth and nobody, but nobody told me what to say or how to testify. 
So I don't know if if certain individuals were targeted to to uh, talk a different story in court, but the evidence that I gave was the truth, and I really don't think that was really applicable in that time. So I, 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 are you suggesting to this court that um, you were under no particular pressure um, to do the right thing in 1982? Um, you felt no um, intimidation whatsoever? That's correct, my lord. Well, I have to say that we will be submitting to this court that uh, that, that pressure was ever present um, in 1982. Um, now, whatever pressure there might have been in 1982, um, I think I'm right in saying that uh, no such pressure, you can't feel any such pressure um, today. Would I be right in saying that? Today? I don't understand the question, my lord. All right, well, let me, let me, let me put it another way, uh, Mr. Swanepoel. Even though the security branch doesn't exist here in 2021, uh, we're suggesting to you that um, that kind of pressure that you might have faced in 1982, uh, you're not facing today. It's, possi it's possible, my lord. Yes. I won't, I won't say it will be a fact that it won't be the same. But am I right in saying that there, there may still be a, a question of how you, as a person, will be regarded um, by your former colleagues and perhaps by people in your community? Uh, I don't understand, my lord. Well, if, if you were to... Um, let's, let's talk hypothetically for a moment. Let, let, let's say that you did decide um, to disclose the full truth and identify individuals involved in, for example, torture uh, before this inquest hearing, um, would your standing amongst your former colleagues um, and your own community not, not be called into question? No, no way, Lord, I don't think so. So you wouldn't be seen as betraying your, your former colleagues in the security branch? No, I don't think so, my lord. Now, in response to um, a question from my learned friend, Advocate Singh for the NPA, she put a statement uh, made by uh, Neil Agat's sister, uh, Jill Berger, and the statement was that the security branch took the view that Neil Agate got what he deserved and your response was no comment. Now, why did you not dispute that statement? I think uh, the question that was put to me uh, went a little bit further. She only didn't refer to the, to, to the security branch, but uh, in general to, to, uh, to information or to, or to the comment of, of the news bulletins and all that. And I said, uh, I don't want to say or make a comment on that because obviously uh, it's not my place to make a comment on, on issues like that. Uh, I was only involved one day to question Neil Agat, Dr. Neil Agat. Yes, um, but let's let, let's 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 focus in on the security branch because my recollection is that Jill Berger imputed that statement um, to how members of the security branch felt about Neil Agat's death, that he got what he deserved. Um, now that we're talking only about um, what the security branch might have thought about Neil Lagut's death, what is your response? My response is, uh, I wouldn't support at all that idea or that uh, view. Uh, I don't think he deserved what he got, really not. 
uh, I was surprised uh, at uh, when I learned that he committed suicide. I didn't see him as a person committing suicide. So that's not a view that you would have held, but is it a view that might have been widely held by other members of the security branch? Uh, I, I don't know, my lord. I, I can't speak for other, other uh, people of the security branch, but my view was uh, nobody deserves to, to, to commit suicide. Now, uh, given what your uh, career trajectory has been, and I'll just uh, summarize, uh, and you correct me if I'm wrong, um, you were in the detective branch uh, for some three years, um, and part of your role while in the security branch uh, was also that of investigation and collection of intelligence. Uh, is, is that correct? Uh, my role in security branch was mainly a field worker collecting uh, intelligence, but not investigations. And what is the difference between investigations and collecting intelligence? The difference is uh, handling sources, registered sources to obtain intelligence which, uh, uh, which would enable the security branch to act upon that, that may lead to further investigation or detention of people. Yes, so you, you, ultimately you were um, building um, profiles and information on individuals for purposes of acting against them and potentially making cases out against them. That's correct, my lord. Criminal cases. So, in, in, in actual fact, it is a, a form of inquiry or investigation, um, even if you weren't necessarily holding an, inv an investigation docket. That's correct, my lord. If it puts in that way, I agree. Yes. So, by by 1982, you then had accumulated in the region of 12 years experience, be it in investigation, coupled with um, intelligence collection. That's correct, my lord. And by the time you re re retired in, in 1997, um, that experience had, had accumulated to some 28 years. 25 years, my lord, correct. For 25 years. Um, so I, I, I think it's fair to say that um, certainly by 1982, you were something of a seasoned and experienced um, police officer, given your investigation and intelligence background. And certainly by the time you, you left the, the force, um, you could also be described as, as one of the more experienced uh, members of the security branch. Uh, that's correct, my lord. Now, I want to draw your attention to um, something that the investigating officer in this case, Captain Victor, did during the course of his investigations. Um, and my lord, I'll be relying on Captain Victor's statement, which is exhibit B1.4. Um, one of the tasks that Captain Victor reflected in his uh, statement before the 82 inquest court uh, is reflected in paragraph um, 13 of his statement on page 2. And he said that he collected a copy of a document by the name of Inkulaleko Freedom, dated February 1972, which he retrieved from the files of the security police in Johannesburg. Um, I don't know if you happen to have a copy of that exhibit. 
Uh, never mind, Lord. I don't have. Right. Well, um, I, I can assure you that that's that's what Captain um, Jakobus Adrian Victor reflected in, um, in in his statement. Now, as it turns out, um, that document in Kulaleko Freedom of February 1972. Um, and, and the Lord, that is also an exhibit, it's exhibit B1.1. And on the last page of that document, on page seven, and I'll just quote you the, the passage. In, in fact, the uh, th third last paragraph from the bottom reads as follows. It says, uh, harass your enemy by going on hunger strikes, act insane, lodge complaints, whether true or false, resort to civil and criminal actions in courts as often as possible, make sure your complaints and actions against the suppressors get the utmost publicity. And then I want to emphasize this last sentence, rather commit suicide than to betray the organization Now, as an experienced uh, police officer, why do you think Captain Victor, Victor saw fit to retrieve this document, a 1972 document, from the security branch files uh, and make it part of his investigation docket into the death of Neil Agate? Well, Lord, I can only think that the, the document can act as proof that that uh, ANC people are, are reminded, activists are reminded that uh, rather to betray their, their fellow, their fellow uh, colleagues is to, to resort to, uh, to suicide. And I, and I think this is a way of proving that Dr. Neil Agat could have committed suicide than rather betraying his fellow colleagues. Mm. But wh wh why do you think that the police at the time um, would need to prove that he committed suicide through documents like this when presumably, you know, the forensic evidence of what they found in the cell should have been sufficient? Well, Lord, I only think it was used as a supportive document to strengthen the uh, strength to strengthen the the, the the inquest that was held. Yes. Now we think it's it's no coincidence that this document also featured in the um, inquest of the late Ahmed Timal. Um, you 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 you're aware of the case of the late uh, Ahmed Timal. Uh, I have heard about it, my lord. Yes, and you're aware that uh, it's alleged that um, uh, in 1971, um, on the police version, Ahmed Timal committed suicide by jumping out of the 10th floor window of John Foster Square. I can recall it, my lord. Yes, uh, and you might also recall that in the reopened inquest in 2017, um, his lordship, uh, Mr. Justice Motley, found that in fact, uh, Mr. Timmel did not commit suicide by jumping out the 10th floor, but in fact was murdered um, bec because he was in fact thrown out the 10th floor window. I wasn't aware of that, my lord. But uh, I listen to what you said to me, yeah? and uh, I accept that's what was found, yes. Yes. And um, the court in, in the reopened inquest in 2017 um, also made a finding uh, in relation to the passage I just read to you in the document in Kulaleko Freedom, and the finding of the reopened inquest was that that passage 
was a transparent fabrication made by the security branch to bolster their claim that Mr. Timal had committed suicide? I wasn't aware of that, my, my lord. Um, Lord, I'll just give you the citation of the um, Timor Reopened Inquest judgment. It's in the Reopened Inquest of the late Ahmed Timor, 2017, ZAGPPHC 652. And this the court deals with this document from pages um, 106 through to 109, but a paragraph 287, um, it makes the finding that that paragraph in that document was forged. It was in fact a fabrication and a forgery on the part of the security branch. Now that you're aware of the uh, finding of the reopened inquest, that that passage in Killer Lurk of Freedom was forged, um, does it not smack of a cover up on the part of the police um, in relation to both um, what happened in Timor and, in fact, in Agate? Well, what happened to Timor and the founding of the poor day, uh, I, I, I accept that. I don't know if, if, uh, if it can be applicable in, in Dr. Neil Agat's uh, suicide. Uh, I, I never before this day heard of that paragraph in that document and the fact that it was forged. Yes, we, we, we think it's quite telling that um, Captain Victor saw fit to retrieve this document from the files at Security Branch and include it in his docket because it's beginning to look like it's the go-to document in the cases of suicide. It was put up in the Timor matter and now we, we discover that it, it was also part of the investigation docket into the death of Neil Agate. I, uh, dear my lord, uh, it is it is disturbing to, to know that that uh, is the fact. But I really am not in a position to to either uh, comment positively or negatively on that. I would rather say I listen to what is said to me and the possibility is there. Yes. Well, we, we're also uh, disturbed by the fact that the document featured in, in both um, alleged suicide cases. Um, Mr. Swanepoel, when did you first come to hear of Dr. Neil Agat? Of his suicide? Uh, you know? No, no. When did you first come to um, learn of, of the existence of, of Dr. Neil Agat? Well, uh, Dr. Neil Agat featured in intelligence that was gathered, gathered by different security branches. Uh, I never knew him as a person. I never uh, saw him before the day that I was instructed to question him, but his name was familiar with me and obviously he, he was figuring in intelligence reports of the different security branches. Uh, and, and in fact, um, according to your evidence, the very first time you saw him was um, on the morning of the 30th of January. That's good, my lord. And if I heard you correctly, in fact, when you pitched up on the morning of the 30th of January, you didn't even know that you were going to be interrogating Dr. Agat. That's great, my lord. You, you, you mentioned quite extensively uh, in response to 
questions put by your own council, as well as that of Advocate Singh for the NPA, that you adopted the um, soft approach um, when it came to interrogations. That's good. It, um, good. Um, I presume that you were aware that that other interrogators may have adopted a hard approach uh, in, in their interrogations. Uh, I am, I, I am, uh, your lord. And what would be the essential difference between the soft approach that you adopted and the, the, the hard approach that other colleagues may have adopted? What, what, what made up the hard approach? Uh, I never referred to the hard approach term, but uh, the soft approach term, I believe that you can get more uh, cooperation of a detainee if you treat him well and you try to persuade him to talk the truth. And I can only imagine that some of the colleagues I can, I, uh, did resort to different methods. And this will obviously include uh, the, the actions that I uh, testified about in, uh, in my main evidence. Yes. So perhaps just to cut to the chase, um, colleagues that adopted the, the hard approach would from time to time um, uh, go beyond the, the pressure that you've spoken about, which is the soft approach, and in fact engage in um, assaults in order to encourage detainees to speak the truth. And is so? Yes. So it's probably also true that the security branch um, adopted what is sometimes referred to as the, the good cop, bad cop approach um, to interrogations? It was really ne never spelled out to me that uh, there will be a good cop and a bad cop questioning an individual. Uh, out of my own belief, out of my, the person I am, uh, I uh, didn't treat people bad, or I try not to, to treat any entirely bad. Uh, I don't think I made use of the soft approach and the, and the hard cop approach. Yes, they, they, they may not have used those particular terms, but from your evidence, it seems in fact that it, it was practiced. I, I suppose one can see it in that way, my lord. Yes, and, and if we are using the famous terminology, then um, you would have been uh, the good cop and others would have been bad cops. I suppose so, my lord. And in, in your approach, um, you would have provided some relief to the unrelenting abuse that the bad cops would have meted out. It, it can be viewed like that, my lord. Now let's 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 move to um, the interrogation of, of Dr. Agate. Um, although the, the terminology uh, may not have been used, but would I be correct in saying that um, the good cop bad cop approach may have been used in relation to Dr. Agate? Not not during my time of questioning, Dr. Agate. That specific day that I was involved in his questioning uh, with uh, Major Fisser, uh, there were definitely not uh, intimidation or insult on Dr. Neil Agat. Yes. Well, according to Dr. Agat, the, the night before, on the night of the 29th of January 1982, there were certainly some bad cops present. Um, and I'll just put the passage to you from his complaint uh, to Sergeant Blom, uh, which was made on the 4th of February 1982. Uh, my Lord, that's Exhibit B8.1. 
point fifty five. Um, and it's the fourth paragraph from um, from the signature. It reads as follows. Um, I was kept awake since the morning of 28th January to 30th January 1982. During the night of the 29th January 1982, so this is the night before you arrived uh, to interrogate Dr. Agate. He says that Lieutenant Whitehead and another security sergeant whose name I don't know and another black male was also present when Lieutenant Whitehead blindfolded me with a towel They made me sit down and handcuffed me behind my back. I was shocked through the handcuffs. I don't know what they used to shock me. I was shocked a few times. I have a, a scratch on my left pulse, the radial nerve, where I was injured whilst being handcuffed. So according to Dr. Agat, that's what he experienced the night before, you know, only hours before um, you arrived at 6 a.m. on the morning of the 30th. Um, so it does seem that the, the day before there were some bad cops dealing with uh, Dr. Agat. I accept that if that's a statement that Dr. Agat made, I listened to what he said, it could be. Yes. Um, do you have any reason to d dispute th this complaint of Dr. Agat? Do, do, do you think he's fabricating this complaint? I, I haven't any reason to dispute it. Yes. Now, given that Dr. Agat um, um, had been awake all this time, um, according to our calculations, for at least 44 hours by the time you appeared at 6 a.m. on the morning of the 30th. And given that he uh, was repeatedly electrocuted uh, the night before, um, can you really gain the trust and confidence of someone who's been through all of that? Well, Lord, I wasn't aware of this. It was never carried over to me. Uh, uh, when we start questioning Dr. Agat the next morning, uh, he didn't complain about it. Uh, I wasn't aware of it. And my purpose, and I'm sure my Fiss, I can't speak on his behalf, but uh, my, my purpose was to try and win Dr. Agat's uh, trust and that he can start opening up about his activities. But uh, just as a matter of, of logic, um, Mr. Swanepoel, the detainee in question was treated like an animal the night before. He was electrocuted. And you might be aware that animals, livestock, you know, um, electric prods are used with them. So Dr. Agar was treated like an animal the night before. Um, you're now aware of that. Logically, um, I put it to you that the prospects of gaining somebody's confidence and winning him over in those circumstances are not good. In fact, they're probably close to zero. I agree with that, uh, my Lord. So then I want to put it to you that your claim um, in 1982 and before this court that you had won over his trust and gained his confidence through your soft approach cannot be correct. It is correct, my lord. I testified in the 1980 uh, inquest and I, I've got no reason to, to say that's not what happened. I testified that and it was like that. Uh, did it happen? So as far as you were concerned, um, you had managed to gain his confidence and his trust. And so towards the end of your interrogation on that day, he was now willing to, to speak the truth. As far as I'm concerned, my Lord, he's, 
that uh, I'm sure it contributed to his chains and say that he will be willing to talk. I don't know if it's solely only my approach or my interrogation that day that uh, persuaded him to, to view a different option. I can't say that. Mr. Swanepoel, um, surely when officers take over interrogations from others, you get a briefing on what happens. It would it would be what would happen during the previous interrogation. Would you agree it would be irresponsible not to bring to the attention of the fresh interrogators what the previous interrogation interrogators had had done and and, and what they had managed to procure. Uh, I testified that uh, Lieutenant White that, um, and Major Fisser was in was talking to each other when we take over the next morning. Uh, I don't know what was carried over precisely to Major Fisser. If he was fully briefed on what happened the previous night or not, all I know is Major Fisser, when uh, we went to, uh, to, to interrogate Dr. Eggert, mentioned to me that Whitehead has asked him that we must clear up the fact of Mr. Agates, of Dr. Agates' uh, activities uh, with possible link to the then banned ANC. So uh, are you saying that you, you had no discussion, no interaction with Lieutenant Whitehead uh, at all? Uh, well, not at all concerning Dr. Neil Agat. Uh, I just want to put this, maybe I can clarify it better if I say to, to my Lord, uh, Lieutenant Whitehead and Major Fisser was based permanently at John Foster Square. They were part of that, of that security branch. And maybe that's the reason why Lieutenant Whitehead preferred to talk to Major Cronwright and not to me. And uh, I believe what Major, uh, Major, uh, to Major Fisser and not to me is a uh, uh, pardon. And I believe that Major Fisser, what he carried over to me was essential what we had to question Dr. Neil Agat about that day. But surely logic uh, dictates that Lieutenant Whitehead would brief um, Captain Fisser on what had transpired, including the fact that they had attempted to use electric shock treatment and, and how that had worked. Logic dictates that, that Lieutenant Whitehead must have passed that crucial information on to Captain Fisser. Well, Lord, it could have happened. I, I can't, I, I don't know if that had happened, but that wasn't carried over to me. The only thing was, that was carried over to me is what I've testified just now. Now, on the question of the um, soft approach and not um, physically assaulting anyone, there's another security branch officer who has given very similar testimony to this court, and that's um, Lieutenant Ruloff. Uh, Fenter, who also claimed that he never physically assaulted anyone, he only applied pressure. Do, do you recall uh, Rudolf Fenter? I do recall Rudolf Fenter. Now, Advocate Singh has already put to you uh, the kinds of pressure applied by um, uh, Lieutenant Fenter, which he said stopped short of physical assault, so I, I won't uh, take you, you through those um, forms of pressure. Um, but I do want to put to you um, Mr. Fenter's application to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, because he, he did claim uh, amnesty for uh, multiple crimes. 
Uh, my Lord, this is Exhibit G70. Um, and let's start at page 10 of Schedule 1. So at the bottom of page 10 of Schedule 1, uh, it's, off, it's on Afrikaans, but I'll just loosely translate it. Um, the security police were involved in several human rights violations, necessitated by the circumstances and compelled by the war situation. W would you agree with that statement of Jula Fenter? I'm sorry, my Lord, can you just repeat uh, for me, please? Yes. Um, Mr. Fenter says, the security police were involved in several human rights violations. These were necessitated by the circumstances at the time and compelled by the then war situation. My Lord, I, I wouldn't agree with that statement. As far as I'm concerned, there was no war present at that stage. Then let's turn to page 46 of, uh, which is titled uh, Real Offender Schedule, Schedule 3, uh, the Barbara Hodgson-Undersuk investigation. And in relation to this investigation, and of course it's the same investigation that you were involved in, in late 1981 and early 1982, um, he applies for various he applies for amnesty for various crimes, and I'll just pick up on the first two. Um, that's assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm um, and crimen in Europe. Um, and of course, I think we all understand what assault uh, GBH means. Would, would you agree that assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm, given that it talks about bodily harm, is in fact physical assault. Uh, I agree, uh, my lord. Yes. And criminal, criminal injuria would, would include um, uh, disparaging detainees, uh, insulting them, and the like. I agree, my lord. Yes. If you can then turn to bottom of page 47 and top of page 48. Um, he makes reference to um, the fact that several other officers were also involved in the Barbara Hogan investigation under Major Arthur Cronwright. It's top of page uh, 48. Uh, there's a long list of names, but your name is included. Captain D. Swanapool. Uh, I agree, my lord. I, I've, I've seen it. And then in, in the next paragraph, um, he says the following, and, and the rough translation is as follows. Uh, during the interrogations, there were serious assaults as well as degrading actions to various detainees. I, I see it, my lord. And what is your comment on um, that assertion of Mr. Fenter? It definitely uh, doesn't apply uh, to me as such. I was nev never ever involved in uh, physical assaults or, or serious physical assaults intimidation to a certain extent that I've learned uh, could be pressure and intimidation. That I do agree. But uh, that's a, a very broad, uh, broad story in his statement saying that everybody, I don't think everybody was involved in acts like, acts like that. I was definitely not involved in all those acts. Yes. Um, well, he, he's simply saying that during the interrogations, 
um, relating to the Barbara Hogan investigation, um, there were serious assaults and this degrading uh, treatment. And he himself uh, was involved in these crimes. Um, so he really is suggesting that, although he's not necessarily pinpointing you or anybody else, but um, he's suggesting that that was the practice at the time for interrogations in the Barbara Hogan investigation. That could possibly have been, yes. I won't deny it. Yes. And then on page 50, he sets out um, the names of, of, of the victims uh, who sustained that kind of treatment. Uh, and I'll just highlight two names. Ishmael Mamoniat and uh, Neil Agat. It is true that you were involved in the interrogations of, of both Mamoniat and Agat. That's good, eight, my lord. So, certainly when it comes to the, uh, the role of Mr. Willow Fenter, He certainly started off his evidence by saying that he would not have ventured into uh, the realm of physical assault. Uh, but nonetheless, it was demonstrated to him that he, he in fact had applied amnesty and was granted amnesty in relation to physical assault as in assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm in relation to interrogations he was part of. Barbara, I didn't hear that. You played away. I couldn't hear the full question. Yes. Are there is some. Uh, there is some. I think we had a full question either. Yes, there, there is some interference. I fear it may be coming from somewhere else in the uh, Mr. Amaji's chambers. Uh, and if there's a window open perhaps and there's out traffic outside or people moving around. Can you hear? Oh, sorry, apologies. Is it still making that noise? Uh, okay, it's, it's died down now. Th 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 thank you, Advocate Energy. I, I think maybe it was the air when I turned it off. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. I hope you don't get too uh, hot in there. <laughs> um, the, 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 the question is, is the following, uh, Mr. Swanepoel. Um, well, I, I need to put it to you that, in fact, it was routine practice under the Barbara Hogan investigation for interrogators uh, to use physical assault um, as well as to disparage and insult the detainees. That, that was routine practice under that investigation. I, I, can't, I can't agree to the team practice. Uh, all I can say, uh, if it was like that, uh, it definitely did not uh, persuade me to be uh, abusive towards detainees. Now, in response to a question posed to you by Advocate Singh, um, you said that you never seriously assaulted anyone. And of course, the question arises, well, if you didn't assault anybody seriously, did you ever assault anyone less seriously? I, I really can't remember. Uh, if it could have happened. Yes, I, I have some difficulty with uh, with that answer, uh, Mr. Swanapool. Um, in response to another question, you, when you were asked whether you slapped anyone, you also said you can't remember. And I want to put it to you that if you had slapped someone, or assaulted that person even less seriously, you would remember. Uh, 
My Lord, I really can't remember that. Uh, it would have been possible, I wouldn't deny it, but I can't remember doing that. Well, the, the fact that it was possible and it could have happened is, 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 is quite telling, uh, Mr. Swanepoel, because uh, what you are saying is that uh, you may very well have assaulted some, assaulted a detainee, but not in a serious way, in a less serious way, such as in slapping uh, a person. It could be said like that, yes. Yes. And in that regard, I want to put to you the evidence of Mr. Paul Erasmus, who at that time uh, was a sergeant in the security branch at John Forster Square. Uh, my Lord, I'm referring to uh, the statement of Mr. Erasmus marked Exhibit G29, and I'll be referring to paragraphs 34 to 36. Um, and I just want to read these passages to you and, and, and you can offer comment. Uh, History has now shown how badly detainees were treated in detention. I personally saw how detainees were badly beaten. When inspectors came to John Foster Square, detainees would often be removed from their cell for further interrogation. The inspector would then be told that the detainee was not in a cell and would be unable to see him. The system allowed the security branch to get away with practically anything. Do you have any comment on that passage? I, uh, really, I, I, I can't uh, comment on that because uh, I wasn't aware of that practice that uh, the tainies were removed with the intention for the inspector of the tainies to visit them or magistrates to visit them. I mean, there were strict rules in place that uh, the tainies must be available when visits of inspectors uh, take place or when uh, doctors must be seen. And we, we've also placed evidence before this Honourable Court that um, detainees who had been um, injured with visible injuries through um, in, uh, torture and interrogation that they were kept in detention until their injuries healed. Have you heard of that practice? I'm not aware of that, my lord. L let me put another paragraph from the affidavit of Paul Erasmus, and that's paragraph 35. We were trained to apply torture to avoid detection. For example, we were taught that bruises lasted for about two weeks and could be easily detected by doctors so to avoid detection, detainees would be hit with a flat hand, as in a slap. Um, your response to that? I was not aware uh, of the reason, uh, that reason that, uh, that the detainees must be hit by a flat hand to avoid injuries. He also says uh, requiring the detainees to stand for extended periods would also inflict pain but not, would not result uh, in injuries and that was commonly used. I'm aware of that practice. Uh, I think I also let the detainees stand. Uh, I don't think it, uh, I wasn't aware that that could be seen as an assault at that stage. Uh, I've done it for two reasons, for the person to stand up a bit from his desk in the second place to, to make him or to, to persuade him to start talking the truth. Well, while we're on the question of enforced um, standing, um, it does seem that this practice um, although on the face of it innocuous, uh, was in fact um, quite pernicious and, and brutal. So I'm going to read you some passages from 
um, statements of other detainees, starting with uh, Prema Naidu. Uh, Lord, I'm looking at Prema Naidu's statement. Um, it's from the folder B2 uh, at page 19. Um, And towards the end of paragraph 40, Mr. Naidu, uh, at that point in time, was at the Farinachan police station. And this is in early December 1981, either the 8th or 9th of December 81. He says he was made to stand up against a wall with his heels hooked on a brick and knees bent slightly. And whenever he, he flagged or got tired, uh, the ginger head man came and jabbed, jabbed him to get him standing to their satisfaction and that this lasted for hours. That, that sounds like quite a brutal treatment uh, to me. Your, your reaction? It sounds like it, my lord. Yes. Um, and another example comes from the uh, statement of another detainee, Oret van Heerden, um, below that's exhibit B4.1.1. And at page 27, rather paragraph 27, on page 18 of his statement, he says that between the 18th and 19th of November 1981, um, he was abused while at Benoni police station and amongst the abuse has been forced to stand for two days. Chambers. Uh, we can't hear you now, Bonnie. We can't hear you. Uh, we can't hear you. Yes, um, there's, there's, there's more interference from Mr. Energy's chambers. It's the, the interpreter went to the bathroom, she just came back. I see, okay. Um, yes, I think it's a very sensitive speaker that picks up uh, all extraneous sounds. Apologies. Okay. Uh, so, so, Mr. Swanepoel. She's seven. Mr. Van Heerden's statement. Says he was forced to stand for two days. With his wrist manacled to his ankle. Um, and as a result, his back became severely injured. That, that also sounds like quite bad torture. Would you agree? I agree, my lord. And then the final example in the question of standing, um, my Lord, I'm going to refer the witness to the affidavit of um, Constable Joseph Nyampule, who was a guard on the second floor cells at John Foster Square. Uh, my Lord, the affidavit was placed before this honorable court last year, marked Exhibit G5. And at paragraphs 57 and 59 on page 15, he refers to a detainee by the name of Paul Lunga, who um, was often taken for investigation and interrogation. And he refers to an incident when Mr. Lunga came back to the second floor cells, but could not walk without support. And Mr. Nyampule says that Mr. Langa reported to him that he had to stand for many days um, and that he didn't doubt um, the claim of Mr. Langa because his feet were swollen like elephant feet. So it, it does seem, Mr. Swanepoel, that this 
forced standing um, could be quite pernicious. Uh, would you agree? I agree, uh, my lord, uh, especially if it takes on a long time. Uh, as far as I can remember, as far as I can recall, uh, people that were asked to stand or, or, or say to stand where I was present it was for about an hour to an hour and a half. And that I testified yes. during the mission. So, so after the hour, the hour and a half, you would allow them to uh, sit down. Um, what if they were still uncooperative? Would you require them to stand up again? Mostly they were uncooperative. Yes. So after allowing them to, to rest a bit, you would require them to stand up again for an hour or an hour and a half? I can't remember that I did that, my lord. Yes, I'm putting it to you that um, if it was done on a repeated basis, um, given that you're saying they were often uncooperative, that, that would uh, would uh, constitute abusive treatment. Would you agree? It could, my lord. Um, I want to turn to the practice of um, forced exercise. Now, you, you testified um, in response to questions put to you by Advocate Singh that you did partake in this practice of requiring detainees to engage in physical exercise. And when asked why, your response was, uh, to give them a little bit of exercise. Do, do you recall? I recall, my lord. Um, and what was the purpose of giving them a little bit of exercise? To help them to get fit? Or what, what was your aim? My lord, it was... Uh, the idea was to let the... the, the, the to let the person run a bit, I, I usually ask them to, to jog a bit on the same place and to, then I would allow them to sit down and then we would start re-questioning him on what we believe he could have told us. So, I, Mr. Swanepoel, are, are you seriously expecting this court to believe that you just wanted to give the detainee uh, a little bit of a break uh, by jogging on the spot uh, before you no. continued questioning? No, my lord, I, I wouldn't want the court just to believe that. I, I was uh, I was told at a later stage and when we talked about this, and when I gave evidence, I was pointed out that this came down to pressurise the detainee. Uh, seen in that light, I agree that it was a measure of of pressurizing him to talk. Yes. So, to... so in, in, in fact, the claim of a little bit of, of exercise for the sake of exercise is, is simply incorrect. Is that, is that right? My Lord, at, at that stage, I was a fanatic gymmer and I thought uh, exercise a bit, always do good. And I still believe in that that exercise do good. So, uh, yes, I thought at that stage that uh, that a bit of exercise could help the tiny maybe to, to up, open up a bit. To, to open up a bit. And, and, and you wish this court to, to believe the evidence that it was simply a question of um, um, letting the detainee do some exercise because it's always good to exercise? That's what I believe, but I know now that it could be seen as a way of torture or as a way of putting pressure on the detainee to, to, to start to uh, open up. But come now, come, come Mr. Swanepoel, it can't be both. It's either one or the other. I really think, uh, my Lord, it was both that contributed. Yes. Well, I, I, I must put it to you. Um, uh, Mr. Swanepoel, that the suggestion that you were simply doing them a favour, asking them to exercise uh, a little, 
is, is, is nothing more than an outright lie. I don't agree, uh, my lord. Um, can you remind us uh, what types of uh, enforced physical exercise you imposed on detainees? I testified that uh, I could, uh, could have raised my voice at the detainees, uh, could have let him stand for a period, for an hour or so, could engage him in some exercise. And then the last thing that I, I recall, I said that uh, telling the detainee that it would be his own good best to talk the truth, come out with the truth, and this could prevent maybe that he's in a later charge and uh, get some jail sentence. Um, well, let, let me give you um, a flavor of the kinds of enforced exercise that um, other detainees have alleged be before uh, this honorable court. Um, Prima Nadu says he was forced to do sit-ups, push-ups, um, kneeling on the ground, uh, and marching on the spot. Uh, my Lord, that's at page 878 of the 2020 Consolidated Transcript. Uh, Mr. Prima Nadu alleges that. Does that sound right to you, the kinds of exercises that would be required? I'll just remind you, sit-ups, push-ups, uh, kneeling on the ground, marching on the spot. That could have happened, but definitely not while I was interrogating a detainee. Um, Mr. Monty Nasu um, also alleged enforced exercise. Um, this is um, Mr. Nasu's statement in the B2 folder at page 1019, pages 4 to 5. So Mr. Nasu says that um, he was required to squat with his hands outstretched. He had to run on the spot with his hands outstretched. And he had to kneel on the ground for long periods with his hands outstretched. Were those also typical forms of exercise required? Uh, my Lord, that never happened in my presence, as far as I can remember. Now, Mr. Paul Erasmus, in his testimony before this court, he commented on this practice of enforced um, exercise. And my Lord, that's a Pages 1837 to 1838 of the 2020 transcript. Uh, Mr. Paul Erasmus, then Sergeant Paul Erasmus, said the aim was to disorientate a detainee, um, to abuse him by not leaving any marks, and to push him to the point of exhaustion so that he couldn't resist. Any more questions? Couldn't resist uh, answer, uh, not answering questions. Was that was that the point of forced exercise? Not as far as I know. I know. Although you you have conceded just a few minutes ago that, uh, in fact. The objective behind enforced exercise was to apply pressure. And that was later put, it, put to me, uh, my lord. So are you saying that with the benefit of hindsight, um, you could see that the purpose was the application of pressure to the detaining? That's correct, my lord. But are you seriously suggesting that at the time you didn't see it as applying pressure? At that time, I've seen it uh, is to, uh, to a certain extent, help the detainee to come out with more information, yes. Yes. 
Well, I, I want to put it to you. What, what we will argue is the real purpose behind uh, enforced exercise. Um, and that is for purposes of fostering cognitive and emotional and psychological exhaustion leading to breakdown. I take note of that, my lord. Yes. And do you agree that that's the real purpose behind requiring a detainee to engage in strenuous physical exercise? I, I really can't agree to that, my lord. Why not? Because because the exercise that uh, that I gave the tiny's didn't went to that extent. To most, maybe maybe some of the interrogators uh, was practicing uh, different kinds of of exercises uh, when they were interrogating people. I only applied as I've testified. <laughs> Now, so you can agree that um, extensive physical, enforced physical exercise uh, does constitute torture, but the physical exercise that you imposed stopped short of torture. That's how I saw it, my lord. Yes. And when you interrogated uh, Dr. Agat, uh, did you require him to exercise at all? Not at any stage, my lord. You, you felt no compulsion just to give him a break and to do a little bit of exercise? No, my lord. Well, let's, let's turn to sleep deprivation and it's, it's quite apparent that uh, you were aware that this was a common practice employed by security branch uh, interrogators on, on detainees. That's correct, my lord. Yes. And in fact, in keeping Dr. Agat um, awake for the 12 hours on the 30th of January was part and parcel of that practice of sleep deprivation. I wouldn't agree to that, my lord. Yes. Or we'll, we'll, we'll return to that. Um, well, actually, before I put to you what I believe the purpose of sleep deprivation is, let me just put to you the um, schedule of interrogation on the long weekend, and this is all reflected in the various occurrence book entries uh, and also backed up by what is contained in, in statements. And let's start on Thursday, 28th of January, 1982. The occurrence book reflects that Dr. Agat was taken from uh, the second floor cells to the 10th floor at 0825 hours. So 25 minutes past eight in the morning, he was taken up to the 10th floor. He was then interrogated by Lieutenant Whitehead, Detective Warrant Officer Carr, as well as Warrant Officer Carl DeBrain, uh, until 14H41, so roughly 20 past two, and then taken back uh, to the cells. Just shortly late, later on the same afternoon, he was again collected from the cells at 16H18, about 20 past four in the afternoon. He was then interrogated by Lieutenant Whitehead and Warrant Officer Dirk Lucas until 6 a.m. on Friday morning. Now we come to Friday the 29th of January. 
The record reflects that Whitehead and Lucas um, interrogated him till 6 a.m. that morning, as mentioned. Then the brain was alone with Dr. Agate from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. that afternoon. Then Dr. Agate was interrogated by Lieutenant Whitehead and Warrant Officer De Brain from 1600 hours on the 29th through to 6 a.m. the following morning, that's 30th January. And then you will recall that you came on the scene at 6 a.m. that morning. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, yes, you, you, you together with um, Captain Fisser, and you had Dr. Agate through to 6 p.m. Um, that evening. Now, according to our calculations, by the time you arrived on the scene at 6 a.m. on the morning of 30th January, um, Dr. Agate had been awake for 43.5 hours. Uh, your comment on that? Uh, Maloga wasn't aware of that, and I wasn't filled in about that. Right. Um, and then after you knocked off at 6 p.m. that afternoon, the interrogation continued um, by Dietlifs, Warrant Officer Dietlifs, Captain Wunsrecht, and Lieutenant Whitehead. And that then proceeded through to 3.30 a.m. on the morning, on the Sunday morning, 31st of January, 1982. Um, now, according to our calculation, by the time you had gone off duty at 6 p.m., uh, on the Saturday afternoon, he had been awake for 55.5 hours. And when he was eventually taken back to his cell at 03.30 in the morning on the Sunday, um, he had been awake for some 65 hours. Now, I know you're, you're saying or claiming that you were not aware of that, but what's your comment on the fact that um, this interrogation, he was out of his cells, um, being interrogated by different teams for some 65 hours. Uh, I can't believe it. That's my comment because uh, as far as I know, uh, that uh, I was only involved from that 12 hours. I wasn't aware. But I think uh, to keep a person out of the cells for that time is definitely not feasible. And uh, the fact, but on the other hand, I listen that he was taken back to his cells at some stages, and uh, according to what you just read to me, and that he uh, was fetched later on. So I don't know if he was the whole time in the cell, uh, in, the, in the offices. But well, it's not. It's unbelievable. That's all I can say. Yes, I, I can put it to you that the, you know, un unless the occurrence book was um, forged, but it does reflect, and it's backed up by the statements of these different officers that I have mentioned, that in fact he was away from his cells from the afternoon of 28th uh, January through to the um, early hours of um, the 1st of February, Monday morning. So that, that's, 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 that's a matter of record. Um, there is an allegation that he was allowed to sleep um, on the last night, the Sunday night, uh, from midnight through to 3.30 a.m., although that claim, uh, we will be arguing, is fabrication. Um, so given the fact that he was out of his cells, uh, for 65 hours, which is not disputed. No, no police uh, officer has disputed that. Um, do you agree that that constitutes abusive treatment, which in fact amounts to, to torture? Uh, I agree that it definitely is abusive, uh, my lord. 
And I want to put the following statements to you. We will argue that prolonged sleep deprivation um, is a cruel and useless method of interrogation. Would you agree? I would agree, my lord. We will also argue that prolonged sleep deprivation is an especially insidious form of torture because it attacks the deep biological functions at the core of a person's mental and physical health. I will acknowledge on that, my lord. Yes. Well, let, let me rephrase it. It's aimed, it's, aimed at, it's aimed at undermining the, the detainee's mental and physical health. It could lead to that, my lord. Yes. And in fact, uh, the purpose behind prolonged sleep deprivation is to disorientate the detainee and to break down his resistance. I wasn't aware of that, my lord. But at, at the time, would you not agree that that was the purpose? You, you wish to place the detainee in a position where he was less resistant uh, to answering questions? I would, I would agree to that, my lord. Lord, I, I see it's nearly um, 4 p.m. Uh, perhaps this would be an appropriate time for the adjournment. Uh, we, we, we do require uh, Mr. Swanepoel to be present again at 1 a.m. tomorrow morning. Yes. Okay. Very well then. Um, it's now four o'clock uh, in the afternoon. I think we've been here for a long time. Uh, Ms. Sonipun, you are required to be here tomorrow at nine in the morning for continuation of questioning. Please be here. This court is now adjourned till tomorrow, the 11th of February at nine in the morning for further hearing. Thank you. You are excused. Thank you, Marlo. As the court pleases. As the court pleases. Thank you, Mr. Advocate Rani. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Amitri. Uh, I think just before we start proceedings tomorrow, if we just do like we had a sound check between yourself and I. Yes, um, but perhaps we should try to do that, what, about 8.30 or thereabouts? Or, or uh, whatever you're, so you're so I, I collect a witness from Benoni. He loves the distance from my house. If I have to collect, if I have to be here by 8.30, I'll probably have to fetch the witness at like 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, okay, let's let, 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 let's do it whenever you are available. Thank you for being understanding, Thank you.